will be Dr. Shore. Would you like to give a little short introduction and then we'll start the timer on you. Yes. It's really a privilege and a pleasure to be able to speak before all of you and, and I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Neil Shore. I'm a faculty member at UC Davis. I've been at Davis for 33 years. I have a PhD in areas of photochemistry and organic chemistry and additional work in organometallic chemistry. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about organic chemistry. I'm going to talk about some things that perhaps won't be touched on so much by the other uh, members of the panel. And since it is quite common for the words organic chemistry to cause eyes to glaze over in something like 15 seconds or less, uh, I will point out my tie here. You're welcome to take a closer look at it. This was a Father's Day gift from my daughter, who was a violinist. Go figure. Um, here is a picture of where some of these atoms are in the periodic table. Chlorine, bromine, iodine. The one above another, so they are in a family that has similar properties, similar behaviors. But what I want to point out on this sheet that I've handed out is that the similarity starts to go away when you look in more detail. As you go down the chart from chlorine to bromine to iodine, the atoms get much heavier and their ability to link to light atoms like carbon diminishes. And so if you take a look at what we have in a molecule such as methyl chloride, which is like a freon, the carbon-chlorine linkage is very tight. It's difficult to break, so that's why those molecules can go all the way up into the stratosphere where the high energy ultraviolet light from the sun blows them apart and damages the ozone layer. In methyl bromide, the linkage is stronger, but the molecule, despite the fact it is heavier, still gets up into the stratosphere and can cause ozone loss. With methyl iodide, things have changed. Now we are at a molecule whose vapor is five times heavier than that of air. The boiling point of methyl iodide is over 100 degrees. So even on almost the hottest days, it is still a liquid. It is not a gas like the other two. So when it is applied in any setting, it is not going to disperse upward in the atmosphere like freons or like methyl bromide does. It's going to stay at ground level. It'll disperse horizontally, and it will sink into the ground. Its affinity for water is greater than methyl bromide or methyl chloride. It will dissolve in the water. It will display much higher chemical reactivity because the linkage between carbon and iodine is 20% weaker than that between carbon and bromine, 40% weaker between carbon and chlorine. And that doesn't mean 20% or 40% greater reactivity because reactivity is exponentially related to bond linkage strength. So methyl iodide is far more chemically and biochemically reactive than methyl bromide or methyl chloride. And so what we have is a trade-off. Yes, it's safe for the ozone layer, but it's far more chemically reactive at ground level. I've used this compound in the laboratory. I used it as a graduate student and as a postdoc, and we used the strictest containment and protective measures for the stuff and only bought it in tiny amounts. It's an oily, heavy liquid. Um, one of the aspects of, of these characteristics, just basic molecular characteristics that have been studied over time by a variety of scientists, the fact that it's one and a half times heavier than, heavier than methyl bromide means that for the, to get the same number of molecules of methyl iodide, you have to use one and a half times more weight of methyl iodide relative to methyl bromide. In addition, since it is a liquid and less volatile than methyl bromide, which is a gas, when you measure in the soil, as a fumigant, how much of the methyl iodide is in the soil vapor phase as opposed to methyl bromide, it's less than half because, again, it is less volatile. So if you wanted to get the same number of molecules of methyl iodide in the soil vapor phase to act as a fumigant, you would have to use three times as much weight of methyl iodide as you would methyl bromide. That's a simple chemical fact. It's not a matter of opinion. It's something that you can look up. Another aspect of methyl iodide, and really the last point I'd like to make, is that since methyl iodide is almost entirely going to percolate downward in the soil as a liquid, it's going to inevitably mix with groundwater. And the only chemistry that's going to take place is ultimate reaction with the groundwater to form methyl alcohol. Now, the time scale of this reaction is going to depend on the alkalinity of the groundwater. The more alkaline the groundwater, the faster this process will be. Under completely neutral conditions, it might be months to years, but the alkalinity, I think, of most groundwater in the state of California is quite high, so we're talking about weeks to months. And this conversion to methyl alcohol, which as we all know, wood alcohol, two teaspoons and you're blind, half a cup and you're dead, um, this is going to contaminate groundwater, and since methyl alcohol boils at a lower temperature than water does, even distillation will not remove it. So think MTBE, if you will. 
in terms of groundwater contamination. Uh, I don't know if these aspects have been studied. These, again, are just basic chemical facts. And, and so with that, um, I welcome any questions that any of you might have uh, about these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shore, and to both of you for